Welcome to a narrative of love, a series of conversations with thinkers and spiritual teachers about their understanding of love and how they see the significance of love in our personal and political lives. I'm Shito Gill, and I'm your host of this conversation series. Our guest today is Dr. Lena Rachel Anderson, who is an economist, author. Futurist, philosopher, and building activist. Since 2005, Lena has written 16 books and received two Danish Democracy Awards. Amongst the books are the famous "The Nordic Secret," published in 2017, and "Building," published in 2020. Welcome, Lena. Thank you so much for joining me. For a narrative of a love conversation, Spirit of Humanity Forum is concerned with the core human values. So our hope for this conversation series is to create a space to explore different possibilities, especially in terms of choices and directions that the leaders might take to build a more loving and a caring world. As a start. Would you briefly visit your own life history, and reflect on what love has meant to you, and how you have arrived at such understandings? Wow, that was a that was a big that was a big opener. <laughs> so、uh, I would say that I、uh, I I'm Danish. I grew up in Denmark in a suburb outside of Copenhagen in a very Uh, loving and caring middle class family as an only child,、um, which was incredibly boring, <laughs> but with、uh, very loving and atten- attending、uh, parents, and with、uh, four cousins that I had a lot of fun with, and I had really good friends in school. So I would say、um, the the f- love foundation of my life with with strong connections、uh, was very solid. So、um, it's a good start, but I was also a, a I didn't. I never really fit it in anywhere. So I, I've always, you know,、uh, been the unruly child at the back row of the classroom, throwing spitballs and coming up with jokes about the teachers. And so very quickly, my path was into humor. But I also had a, a huge, or very early, I would say,、um, struggle with with faith and with.、Um, Is there a god or is there not a god? My my mother's side of the family was culturally very Christian.、Uh, I I mean in Danish context rather Christian, but in a U.S. or I would say the rest of the world context not very Christian. So for、um, so Christianity、um, was was very present in my childhood, but in in a very relaxed way I would say, and with a lot of I mean、uh, natural science and critical thinking. In the school and in the family and everything, so, so that would be my, my,、uh, my intellectual and and spiritual、uh, background, and I was also、uh, I was a Girl Scout with the Christian Girl Scouts, and I started when I was seven, and then when I was twelve, I became one of the leaders, and until I was seventeen, I was one of the young adult leaders for the seven to ten year old girls, which taught me a lot about、uh, leadership and taking responsibility and.、Um, And about how to, you know, get groups of people, in this case, children, girls, to to work together and、um, and have fun. So、uh, so that's part of my background. And then yes, I studied theology for a while and、uh, ended up converting to Judaism. I started Christian theology and, and converted to Judaism. So that has been part of my path. And、um, so I'm I'm rounded by that. I mean, that's that's part of my building. That's part of my formation. That I grew up in an environment like that. And so that is, of course, defining for my、uh, perception of the world and who I am and, and the chances and opportunities that I've had. Now,、um, in your in your theological studies and the philosophy philosophical studies, and、um, also the religious upbringing, and so on. Let's just focus on that because you think of religion. Whenever we think about religion. And it seems like the common word is love.、Mm. And what is your experience of love from 
um, member of a religious community, for instance. Right. So, uh, so I mean, I've I've lived religion in two different religions, and um, and the Christianity that I grew up with was, as I said, it was very modern, liberal, um, open-minded Christianity. Uh, but one of the things that that always bothered me was this sense of you must love Jesus. So there's this there's this demand on your emotions where if I did not have the right emotions, there was something wrong with me. And I, I always had a problem with that, particularly because as a child, you want to you know, you want to be a good child. You want to do what the adults tell you to do. I mean, you, you want to behave you like you want the, the adults to love you. Um, so so if you didn't have the feeling or if you didn't really know what it meant to love Jesus, you kind of created this fake feeling that I, I don't even have a word for it in English, but it's um, you, you create a feeling inside yourself that doesn't really come from yourself. And, and you, I mean, and, and that's not a good thing um, because it, it's fake and it's it, fake feelings are not a good thing. So, um, and, and then you create a culture around it where you sort of encourage each other to produce this feeling and eventually, at some point, you start thinking, how many of the other people are also kind of faking this, this emotion? Uh, and how many actually feel it? And so I, I think that was, that was a very unhealthy part of it. What I really liked about the Christian upbringing was, of course, that there was um, a value system. And there was something in the culture that was more important than all these outer status symbols and all the, you know, um, the, the, the fast pace and the you know ambition career uh, material world consumerism all this stuff that there was a spiritual room and a beautiful room aesthetic rooms uh, churches and uh, all kinds of uh, houses of worship it, that's not just Christianity where you could I mean literally walk in from a busy street and be in a different kind of world and I really always, I, I always like that and love that. And I, I love it whenever, you know, I'm a tourist and walk into a foreign church or synagogue or mosque or whatever, and, and, and sense that sense of um, silence, calm, being present uh, and, and being focused on something else than everything out there, all the noise. So, so uh, I, I, ha I mean, I, I brought that with me and, and has always been sort of a parallel track to everything else that I did. And then I've had, you know, on and off, I've been an atheist. Part of my transition then from, from Christianity to Judaism and what made me uh, change my religion was that I really liked the open inquiry that, that isn't Judaism. There's always, you know, you take a piece of text and then you discuss it and nobody demands uh, any specific feelings from you regarding God or the Torah or anything that you do. Um, instead, it says you must do so and so. And to me, that's an intellectual freedom. So um, there's a there's a time schedule throughout the week towards the Sabbath. And, um, and there are some dietary uh, rules. And that works very well for me, and it gives me complete intellectual freedom. So that was, so that was, I mean, that was the short version of, of why I, I changed my religion. Um, and I, I'm now at a point in life where um, I'm fine with both religions. It's, it's very hard when you convert from one religion to the other to, you know, keep loving the old one. But I, I, I do love both religions now, but of course in different ways. So. Um, yeah, let's focus on that spiritual connection. So at this point of human history, we we really in need of that because we are experiencing what may call it lingering anxiety, complexity, uncertainty. So it's a form of a perplexity about our future. So this book, The Nautic Secret, a European story of beauty, and freedom. I'm going to come back to the story um, later in terms of what story we might need now. And you call it with Thomas Bjorkman. Well, in fact, Thomas presented the ideas in the book at the last Spirit Humanity Forum. He talked about those retreat centers emerging in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway at that time about 150 years ago. 
that not only contributed to this inner transformation that we talk about, but also helped propel Nordic countries towards becoming what we now see as the thriving democracies and the welfare societies. Now, you also mentioned in early, this has been an important um, illumination in, in terms of your own understanding of the world. So would you just help us understand how the Nordic Fork High School, that was it called, the Ruchvik Center of Nordic Fork High School or Fork Colleges, managed to reach such societal transformation through introducing a particular kind of education to young people. Yeah, so I mean, we're, I mean, 150, 180, 200 years ago, Europe looked extremely different. I think we all know that and the entire world did. Um, so you have to imagine that you have some young people who in Denmark uh, got seven years of school and then they had their Christian confirmation and you had to have that Christian confirmation around age 14. Otherwise, you couldn't uh, become an apprentice. You couldn't uh, get a job and you could not get married. So it was like and you had to be able to read and write in order to have your confirmation. You also had to be able to read Luther's catechism and answer all kinds of, you know, questions about Christianity. It was a very Christian upbringing. Um, and then you went out and, and started working as a farmer on somebody else's farm. And that was the rest of your life. And then suddenly there's this new kind of school, which is a boarding school. And it's a five month program for young men and a three month program for young women. And when you're 18 to 25, you can go there if you can afford it. So you work for a couple of years, maybe a parents have a little bit of money, maybe you have a rich uncle or something, and they want to, you know, send you away to open your mind, uh, learn some new agricultural techniques, um, study history, learn about your country. And uh, that's very appealing. Uh, I mean, how many young people 150 years ago had, you know, five months off to just, you know, study poetry and figure out for themselves what is what is important in this life. So that is what those schools were about. And it took a while for them to find the format and the form that worked. And I'm going to skip the long intro and just say that what did work was this five uh, month program for the young men and the three month program for the young women. It was a school teacher uh, named Kristen Cold who came up with a with a format. And what he did was he, uh, he used to work as a teacher and he realized that whenever he tried to teach children what he was supposed to teach them, they did not pay attention. But when he told them stories, they were listening and he could tell that he captured something inside them, they lit up. And so um, he started reading out loud um, heroic novels about the Danish history. So medieval novel knowledge uh, novels with, you know, heroic uh, I don't know, medieval knights and fighters and stuff like that. And so you have these 18 year olds who are together in a farmhouse with 20, 30 other young men. And they hear these stories and something awakens inside them and they feel, I wanna be one of those heroes. I wanna be a good Danish man. Um, and, and once Carl can see in, in their eyes that now they're listening, now they're paying attention. Now I'm like, I got them. Then he allows them to ask questions which 150, 60 years ago was very unusual for young farmhands. They were just used to being taught something and then repeat it. Now an adult person asks them, so what do you think? What, do you have any questions? Ask me something. Uh, how we did it, of course, nobody knows. I mean, we didn't have tape recorders or anything 160 years ago. But this is, this is what he has explained he did and this is what other people who went to these folk high schools have written books about. So. They started asking questions. And once they ask a question, they're also interested in the answer. And then he could start teaching them. And so in these folk high schools, they learned history and um, uh, academics, real historians call it poetic history because it was history taught as a story about who we are. And it was focused on telling the story, which is also why I, I created the subtitle, a European story of beauty and freedom, because we are a storytelling species. And in order for things to make sense to us, we need to tell stories. And so he figured that out. And so he started telling stories about Danish history. And, and then these young people connected with the history and with the country. And that was part of the purpose of the schools was to 
turn them into conscientious citizens because citizenship was the new thing. Um, and at least the voting rights that eventually came with the citizen was the really new thing. So in order for them to take responsibility as citizens, they needed to love their country and understand what kind of thing a country is. And so they also learned some macroeconomics. They learned some, um, you know, about the political institutions. They learned new agricultural techniques. They learned how to brew better beer and make better cheeses. And, um, and they learned the latest science. All together in an organic, you know, what are we talking about today? And, and they also had handwriting exercise so that they could write beautiful letters and learn to express themselves. So what they, what they got at those schools was a voice. And they realized that, oh, I can, I can say something. I can ask questions, I can learn, but I can say something and other people listen. And so then these young people went back to their villages and now they were the cool young people who had been away for five months or three months. And not only that, they were also um, self-confident and they would be the young people who, you know, I mean, would walk up to maybe the local pastor or somebody else in the local community, shake their hand with a, you know, good strong handshake and look them straight in the eyes and see them, you know, eye to eye as equals in a way that young people um, would never have done before. It's beautiful what you described because I, would, I had that question, what exactly happened during the courses? So the storytelling, of course, stories are myths. Myths give you a, a kind of a, a pathways towards meaning making. And here you, you go into the history that was a collective myths Yep. making and that view that that helped these young people to then create their own myths yep. to live by that's really wonderful of course we're talking about the young farm hands so give them um uh, teach them in terms of economics teach them the science technology make them a better administrators better um, innovators of for 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 um when they return to the land and they also think of uh, questioning inquiries, learning to question. These are this is what it preparing them for critical thinking skills and so on. And they listen to because they experience respects and, and how to respect others and what, what being respected means, and so on and so forth. So, but I want to just ask you: beauty is an important part. Now you talk about handwriting is, is part of that, sort of how do you present yourself in a, in a way that is beauty is a form of dignity and so on. But is there anything else within the environment in, concerning beauty? And I also want you to touch upon, as I read it, they sing a lot, they sing yeah. together. So are these, has in, in music, can in, in music and poetry and so on, these will invite you into almost like unconsciously into the realm of beauty. Just want you to comment on that. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for, for bringing that up because, I mean, first of all, with the mythology, one of the very uh, strong components of this was uh, reintroducing the, the Norse mythology to these young people. Uh, I mean, now I just mentioned Christian Cold, who started the first really successful school, uh, but there was a pastor, uh, Nikolai Frederik Severin Grundvig, <laughs> who had come up with the idea originally, but he was a pastor and he wrote about it. And it was so, you know, a stream of consciousness, uh, not specific enough for people to actually figure out how to create such a school. And, and there were some attempts before Kristen Cole started his school in 1851. But Grundvig, um, he rediscovered the, the Norse mythology and, and rewrote it. And, and retold it in writing in order to awaken the Danish spirit, in order to get the Danes to understand that not only the Greek and the Romans had mythology, because I mean, the, the young boys of the bourgeoisie who went to the, the real high schools, uh, they studied a lot of Greek and Latin and knew all those, both the Greek and, and Roman philosophers, but also their mythology but nobody had told them the Danish or Norse mythology. And so Grundvig reintroduced that. And part of the stories that they were either reading or telling at the folk high schools were the stories about Thor and Odin and Frey and all these other uh, Norse gods. So yes, that was, I mean, and that was a mythology. And of course these mythologies are 
presenting archetypes and once you start discussing these archetypes and trying to you know mirror yourself in one or two of them it becomes a personal developmental process and you if you do it together with others um it you you learn about yourself so so yes that played a huge role regarding the the singing uh grundvig wrote about i think 1500 hymns and songs christian uh songs uh in danish and so i mean he's had a huge impact on on the singing tradition in the country but he and other poets wrote a lot of new uh i mean communal singing was the youtube videos of 150 years ago so i mean if you learned a new song and you could go back to your village and say i learned this song you should we should sing this you were the it's like the first person to share the video that goes viral so um so these young people learned a lot of new songs and um of course when you look at them today it's like oh man that's such old stuff and yes because it was 150 years ago but to them it was the new cool stuff um so being a, an 18 year old or a 21 year old 150 years ago was a different kind of youth culture so um but but yes so they were singing a lot and so yes and and the great thing about communal singing as you said it's almost you know touching your emotions and it's also a way of being together plus it's a way of introducing words that you would otherwise not use yourself you expand your vocabulary and the same thing with the mythologies and and, and reading studying hearing about history because it expands your worldview and expands your the, the words that you will you know start using yourself and particularly with singing because then you will actually literally express words with your own mouth that you would otherwise never use so it's also a way of, of expanding your language and then the, the third thing that you mentioned with with the beauty is that the first folk high school was uh an old farmhouse that Kristen Cole bought and then he fixed it up and I guess he also fixed it up together with uh, with the first uh, class of students that he brought in. Um, but as soon as these folk high schools became a folk high school movement and there were a lot of people, wealthy farmers and people in the bourgeoisie and others who really saw that we can't have uneducated farmers that is not good for the country we need educated farmers and we need them to love their country they invested in these schools and particularly the assembly halls in the schools are beautiful um kristen Kahl started his first folk high school in a small village called ruslinge on the island of funen that's the like smack in the middle of denmark um and then after, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, there was a new school built in the same village, but it's like the size of a castle. And uh, and the assembly hall there is just, it, it's such good craftsmanship, artisanship, the way that the, you know, the woodwork and the, the decorations and the paintings on the walls and everything is just so beautiful and inspiring. Um, so so yes and and it's it's like the adult generation were telling these young people we want to give you the best that we have we we want you to expand your mind we want you to expand your understanding we want you to engage with the world and and here's the best that we have to offer and um and i think that we i mean we we could learn so much from that today because what we're telling our children today is you got to take this test and you're going to get a job and you're going to be good at it because otherwise somebody else is taking your job and we've and we've forgotten that this this is the most amazing stuff that, that we have created in our culture please take it study it appreciate it enjoy it learn from it discuss it um and uh, and and beauty has been, you know, completely <laughs> taken out of the equation and left is the money. And that's just, I mean, that's poverty. Yeah. Thank you for this sort of for elaborating on that. That I'm just going to see is if this is and I, I have understood it correctly. So identifying with the heroes is the beginning of not only self awareness but also the beginning in your words, self-authoring. Mm. Because once you identify with someone, you actually trying to live up that, that, Im that image of the hero. 
And who are the heroes? Heroes uh, tend to be those ones, people who have very strong ethical convictions and that they have a certain kind of inner compass that allow them to navigate very complex fields. And so add to that is the life skills knowledge and, um, and um, even um, um, approaches to, to civic engagement. And that leads to uh, these young people participating, as you say, you probably will say more in terms of uh, and the cooperative movement um, in the Nordic countries. So they, when they return to their community, they have the confidence, but also have the will to step up and became uh, and and became the, uh, the 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 pillars of of their own community. So of course, gradually, through all sorts of um, communal um, structures that you talk about in the book, the banks and the cooperatives and, and, and farmers alliance and so on. So uh, uh, from bottom up, gradually large parts of the population will be, will be able to, um, to rise. Mm. And so that's, this is a, a story of human empowerment. It really is. It really is. And I think, and here I'm going to bring in uh, Soren Kierkegaard, because he says that there are two kinds of heroes. There's the aesthetic hero and the ethic hero. And I'm not saying ethical, but ethic, because that's the way he phrases it in, 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 in Danish ethic. So the aesthetic hero is fighting a conflict outside of himself, whereas the ethic hero is fighting a conflict inside himself. And until we are, you know, in our teens, young adults, we look at the conflicts out in the world and try to figure out how would I be one of the heroes who fixed that conflict out there and made, made the world a good place. And then once you have figured that out and internalized that and figured out, so who's the good, what, what is the good behavior? Who are the good guys or girls? Um, that is when you, at some point, can start realizing, uh-oh, I have all these conflicting things going on inside me. I'm not just supposed to fix what's out there. I actually have to fix what's in here. And that's when you start having that um, internal struggle about, so what is actually the right thing to do? Um, and if we look at these young people at the folk high schools, they came from a, a society where seven years of school was the typical thing now everybody gets 10 or 12 years of school and we have media all over the place and we got movies we got particularly action movies with conflicts out there with a hero who fixes them but doesn't change on the inside um and, and these are the blockbusters so i mean that is what speaks to our evolving self until we have figured out so who am i what is what are my what are my values what is a good person and then we hopefully live according to that for a number of years. But then you can start, you know, having new doubts again and say, am I really living up to this? How about all the desires that I know I shouldn't have? How about all the things that I do wrong that I should have done right? I know I'm not perfect. And then you start struggling on the inside. And I think the folk high schools started with the, with the aesthetic heroes in order to get all those young farmhands and girls to think about what is a good person and how do I become one of them? Um, I really like the um, the kind of the journey is the evolving self continue um, building is essentially continue the self transcendent um, the relational process um, and the relationships are I suppose amounts to the um, the young farm hands during that training during the the folk high school. Um, would have a play an important part. In some ways, probably they have, I'm just speculating, they were able to realize that it, it, it is in, in the relational process that we came to be who we are, that we came to recognize what's the, what's the right thing to do, what's the good things to do. The teaching method at the schools with all the conversation and all the questions 
And also one of the things that they did at the schools was that they took the young uh, people to political meetings with all kinds of different political candidates in order for them to make up their own mind. And they were very explicit about, we're not gonna tell them who to vote for. We're not gonna tell them what's the right political agenda, but we're gonna take them out to hear different viewpoints so that they can make up their own mind. And so there is a, I mean, you mentioned the word empowerment. Empowerment is exactly the word that, that this is all about. And it's political empowerment, it's economic empowerment, it's existential empowerment, and it is personal empowerment to sort of, you know, you know, opening up the, uh, the I hate the word energy because I mean, it, it means so many different things, but literally waking up and feeling that you have more energy in your body because you know what you want to do with your life. And, and that is what they, that is what they managed to do. They, uh, Kristen Cole said, first enliven, then enlighten. So once you have them, you know, full of energy and saying, what can I do? Then you teach them and say, well, if you know this stuff, you can do that. And if you know this stuff, you can do that. Um, which is also crucial point here that um, the, the emotional development, the aesthetic appreciation, the, the beauty and the spiritual connection walks hand in hand with practical, useful, factual knowledge. And you can't be empowered if you just feel a lot and have a lot of good intentions, if you don't also have the knowledge that it takes in order for you to actually, you know, uh, start a, a business or uh, run f as a political candidate or, uh, you know, be on the board of the local church or whatever it is, um, or, you know, take responsibility as a good accountant. I mean, there are many ways where you, your skills is part of the empowerment, but you also have the, the drive, have to have the drive and energy in order to make a difference. Yes, I would. Um, I was really fascinated by that aspect in the sense that compared to what would be called a spiritual training today, it's mindfulness, it's silence, it's prayer, and um, it's, uh, it's very much individualistic. You focus on yourself, whereas here, the, 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 the enlivening, self-enlivening, self-awakening is um, happening in the Nordic context within a community. You didn't put the kids into the um, uh, um, individual study room as if they're a helmet and just- Exactly. Read, just, just- Contrary. By, yeah, so instead of going inward, you first uh, uh, go outward look at the history, look at the hero's journey, go and sing and this togetherness, this we-ness, has this kind of sense of we-ness built and, and developed in this, in this um, building process, in this um, Forbes High School, actually provide that basis for, for Nordic countries to, to be these um, welfare societies. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I, yes, absolutely. Um, none of the people who started these folk high schools had any idea, of course, that you could create a welfare state. Uh, what we know today as the welfare state is a post Second World War phenomenon. So 1950s, 1960s, and particularly 1970s. So it's not like we had a welfare state in the 1880s at all. Uh, but yes, the, the sense of solidarity uh, and that you have, and I, and I think the, what makes the difference is that you have a critical mass of people and that may just have to be 10% who have that sense of country first, not in the sense of country first compared to other countries, but country first before I, you know, benefit myself. I mean, what they what they did with telling all these stories about the Danish past and the Norse mythology and getting them to connect to their cultural heritage was, of course, also the sense of this is important. This is who I am. This is how I express myself. This is part of my meaning making. They would have I mean, they would have said that in a different way. But that feeling of this place is important to me. The, the fact that this landscape that I work in every day belonged to other farmers for hundreds of years before me, and they passed it on to me, and it's my responsibility to pass it on to the next generation. That makes you 
show care for your community, for the landscape, for the country, and for you know every everything inside it. And and with that sense of responsibility to something bigger than yourself and bigger than your own family and bigger than the little groups of people that you know personally, but to this idea called Denmark allows you to take political responsibility for everybody in the country. And um, so how do we, this is, this is a question is, how might we in, in integrate this, this flavor of, of, of th these experience in our current education system? And, and of course, to integrate that, we require some changes to education. What are these changes so that we can make education truly transformative processes? And do you, are you aware in your research, in especially in Nordic countries, there's some, such kind of um, change? Uh, I mean, I have some suggestions. Um, I have not had a chance to implement this anywhere, but, but looking at our you know, history as a species and a civilization and the, the need that we have for beauty and uh, how crucial science is and we need to understand where we're coming from and all this stuff. And if we look at it throughout history, I mean, the, the way we, the, that we produce food and shelter and our technologies, I mean, co-evolved with the aesthetics, which co-evolved with the knowledge that we produced and which co-evolved with political structures, power structures, and which co-evolved with moral values and narratives and religion and ethical principles and so forth. And if we have an educational system that is so focused on uh, science and technology in order for young people to get an education so they can go out and be producers and consumers then we lose all the meaning giving the purpose giving parts of education and it's just going to be meaningless data and we're going to have frustrated angry and anxious young children young people who don't know why they're learning what they're learning and and i think that's what we're seeing so if if I were to uh, to design an educational system from you know um, toddlers to uh, to to adults, I would say until they're seven, they should just you know learn to play music, keep in keep a rhythm together, learn to sing. They should have all those great stories. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, the mythology and stories, history from their own place, but with stories from the rest of the world as well to expand their vocabulary and then they can play Thor and Mickey Mouse and uh, I don't know Zeus in the playground in the intermission then they can come back in and start singing so um, expand their 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 inner world by storytelling and let them you know do something dangerous make some stone tools and you know light a bonfire and stuff like that so that they and also you know let them grow some plants some herbs for their lunch or something so that they you know get a feeling for what what the world is like and then when they're seven years old uh until puberty that's when you introduce writing and math geometry uh some science and also some technology let them build little uh you know wooden engines or you know the, the technology that matches the uh, old Babylonians or the Greek. I mean, the, the mechanical stuff, which is just fascinating to children. Um, and, uh, and and this is also where you can then start, you know, teaching them history in the, I would say the poetic history. It, it, it's where you, you, tell, you, you tell them the stories of how the world evolved and how the, this country evolved and how, I mean, if, if you have different ethnic groups, you can focus on that as well. So where where is that culture coming from and what did that process look like? But make sure that you tell it as a story so that they can see that there's a progression in this and that it, it's connected. So I, I would do that until the uh, they, they reach puberty. And that's where you can start then, you know, uh, be more philosophical at the personal level, I think, and, you know, introduce poetry and the big, you know, romantic authors and get them interested in politics and society. And um, and then from, I don't know, the age of 15, 16, um, introduce quantum physics and postmodern deconstruction of everything. Because then they actually have something they can deconstruct. So, so that would be, that would be my approach to different kind of, of uh, educational system where, where we, 
take better into account what, what children are, are ready to, to handle. Uh, and we, if, if we teach the, um, let's say we teach, you know, quantum physics and postmodernism and uh, I mean, in the, what would that be? High school age, 16 year olds. Um, then you also, you know, take in the Quentin Tarantino movies and the, uh, I mean, the, what happened in pop culture, what happened in modern classical music, what happened in the architecture, along with these new ways of understanding the world, so that the aesthetics and the science are matched when they happened. Because then you also get an idea of society is is functioning as a whole. And, and even today, when there's new knowledge or new art, somewhere it's matched by new technology. And when there's new technology, it's somehow matched by new art and new ways of expressing this. The current education system is permeated with a culture of fear. Fear and coming from a, I think it's a misconception of values. Um, at, the very, at the very beginning, the parents are dominated by fear, fear their child is going to be hurt, they're going to, they're going to lose out if they didn't learn early, read and write and arithmetic and then all that, they're going to fail. And the system continue to be assessed through all sorts of a measurement. Once you put you up as a unit, you're being measured against other units, the nature of the system is clear. It becomes a system of production. In the UK, we call it a, a, a factory model. So competitiveness and fear of failure and narrow curriculum and very much teaching to the test. This is the UK situation. I'm sure Nordic countries are better than us. I, I mean, historically we have been, but we're going down the same path yes. right now. And in yeah. the US, it's really horrible. And, and the US has this whole you know, insurance thing going on where, I mean, even a slight bruise will take you to court and the parents will be ruined for the rest of their life. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Um, so so this, is a, this is a kind of conversation that, that we need to have as a civilization. What is a good childhood? And, and then we need to figure out how can, how can children actually have that? Just to close, um, throughout, we, we have um, talked about the importance of myths and narrative. And because narrative is a myth, these are cultural mythos. They're fundamental to our way of being and becoming. And through those myth, myths and mythology and stories and so on, um, our, our, what we should value, what constitutes a good life and how we might flourish together, these are articulated. So how do you see, supposedly there is this narrative that will help us take the societies, take humanities towards that global well-being? So what this narrative would be, and, and if this is the narrative that I can take us out of the current um, um, perplexity, what choices do leaders have to make in order to um, bring people together, embark on the new hero's journey? Um, I think the, the one big lesson that I, that I have learned from, from the Nordic history is the importance of lifting from the bottom. So you need to get, everybody needs to have a fair chance and everybody needs to have access to the skills and understanding and meaning making that allows them to thrive and make the most out of their life for themselves and for others. And so this is really about empowerment. And you said the word first, and I, I return to it again and again, because I mean, empowerment is the, is, is the key. And in that empowerment is the idea that things could be different, that there is hope, but it's also skills and it's social skills and it's collaboration. And it's also respecting the individual. And we have a tendency to see it. So either you're a collectivist or you're an individualist. And I, I mean, it really is about both. 
So um, if, I mean, my, my narrative would be that we have come such a long way. I mean, our species has been on a, an amazing journey um, from any, even before the modern Homo sapiens sapiens was there, there were, you know, other species of, of Homo who had all these, I mean, the, the, the proto qualities of what it means to be human. And then we spent 200,000 years as hunter gatherers and spread all around the globe. And we were not in contact for all these many, many thousands of years. And then in different places, there were these cultures that just, you know, emerged and grew out and you know, created their own narratives. And now we're reconnecting and we're connecting around the globe. And I mean, literally we are on Zoom now. Uh, I mean, we would probably have been on Zoom without the coronavirus, but uh, we're definitely spending more time on the screen now than we would have otherwise had it been for the coronavirus. And the really bizarre thing is that as a species, we had the knowledge that could have protected us against the situation. The science was there, the warnings were there, the institutions were there, and we didn't pay attention. And so through our breath, we literally, through our breath, risk dying because we did not pay attention. And in all the spiritual traditions, there is something about breath and the importance of breathing. And God breathes life into human beings in almost all of the you know, creation myths. And so we, here we are as a species. I mean, we could, we could choose life and breath or death and breath. And we ended up with the death. And so the, the narrative that we can choose and the choices that we can choose to focus on are the life and the breath and the spirit. And how as a species, we can you know, enjoy and appreciate all the cultural and biological diversity and richness that is around this amazing globe that we inherited. And we, didn't, we did not do anything to get this globe. We were born into it. And it's so amazing. I mean, it's just nature is so rich. And what are we doing to it? We're just exploiting it because we have a failed economic structure, system, idea, narrative. And we have to change that narrative um, and focus on something else. So um, spirit, breath, um, we really share that. And the question is, what kind of, of spirit is, that we, is it that we want to share? And, um, and that's the narrative that we're going to tell. Well, Lena. There's so many meaningful insights here. Thank you so much for sharing them. These will be profoundly appreciated by listeners at the Spirit of Humanity community. I am most grateful for you taking the time to join me in this a narrative of love conversation. We look forward to welcoming you to the forum next June in Iceland.